picture memorization. Uh, today, uh, we are going to study Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 20, with the title, You Are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. Let's read the key verse, 16, 12, please. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise God for your love. And thank God for Jesus, who came to this world to save us from our sins, so that we may be reconciled with God and know the love of God. Heavenly Father, today we came here to hear your word. Please help us to um, answer to Jesus' question, who do you say I am? And we may be able to make a confession from our hearts, like Peter, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Please speak to us, help us to receive your words, and uh, please use me as your servant. Anoint me with the Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In today's passage, Jesus asks his disciples two questions, which dealt with who Jesus is. Jesus did not test his disciples regarding his teachings, his miracles, or his ministry, but in regard to his person. Why? It is because the core of Christian life is to know Jesus personally. So what is the core of Christian faith? To know Jesus personally. Jesus prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Your Son may glorify you. For you grant him authority over all peoples that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they may know you. They may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Many think, of Christian, many think of Christian life in terms of activities, Bible studies, prayers, evangelism, readings, testimony writing and sharing, rituals, ceremonies, works of ministry, and so on. They are important and necessary, however, but the heart of Christian life is to know Jesus and have a personal relations with him. Amen. So what is the heart of a Christian faith? The heart of a Christian life is to know Jesus and to have a personal relationship with him. That's the heart of a Christian life. Knowing Jesus is to know the person of Christ and live in a personal relationship with him. This leads us to grow spiritually in his image. St. Paul grew in his personal relationship with Christ for many years. But as a mature Christian, he said, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. That was his confession. Knowing Christ is a lifelong process. No one can say that they have mastered knowing Christ. Rather, we can grow endlessly and continually in the personal knowledge of Christ. The more we know Christ, the better we can worship Christ. The more we worship Christ, the better we can love one another. May the Lord God help us to know Jesus more personally and love God and love one another. Amen. Now let's look at the Jesus' first question and disciples' answer. Jesus asks, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Eliza, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. John the Baptist was a foreigner who proclaimed the coming of the Messiah to a people who desperately needed a Savior. Eliza was greatly admired for challenging idol worship with courage and zeal. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet 
for he wept over the poor spiritual condition of his people. The people of his generation saw Jesus as a great prophet from God, even though the religious leaders had slandered him. However, the people did not truly know who Jesus was. Jesus is more than a great prophet. Amen. Jesus expected a better understanding from his disciples. He asked, but what about you? But what about you? Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. In answer to Jesus' question, Peter affirms his belief that Jesus was, Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, and more than that, the Son of the living God. By this time, the disciples had seen many miracles, including the coming of a storm, the healing of the blind, the curing of the leper, the healing of the deaf and the mute, the raising of the dead, the casting out of many demons from a man in the care of sins, and feeding over 5,000. The disciples knew that Jesus was more than a prophet. He was absolutely unique. He was, in fact, God in the flesh. Amen. They knew that Jesus is God in the flesh. Can we say that together, please? God in the flesh. Peter called the Messiah, Messiah. Both Messiah and Christ means anointed one. What does it mean by the word Messiah and Christ? Anointed one. Jesus was anointed by God to save his people from their sins, to rescue us from the power of a demon and to baptize with the Holy Spirit. God promised to send the Messiah who will save us from our sins, rescue us from the bondage of Satan, and baptize us with the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament predicts the Messiah, and the New Testament reveals the Messiah to be Jesus of Nazareth. There are several things that the Jewish people who anticipated the Messiah expect him to be, based on the Old Testament prophecies. The Messiah would be a Hebrew man, born in Bethlehem and of a virgin, a prophet akin to Moses, a priest in the order of Melchizedek, a king and the son of David, who suffered before entering the, his glory. Jesus met each of the requirements, these messianic requirements. Jesus met each of them, each of these messianic requirements. Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the Messiah in that he was a Hebrew of the tribe of Judah, and he was born in Bethlehem to a virgin, Mary. Another proof that Jesus was the Messiah is the fact that he was a prophet like Moses. Both Moses and Jesus were prophets whom the Lord knew face to face. But Jesus is even a greater prophet than Moses in that when Moses delivered Israel from slavery, Jesus frees us from the bondage of sin, death, and Satan. Jesus, unlike Moses, Jesus did not just represent God. He is God in the flesh. Jesus does not just lead us to the promised land. He takes us up to heaven for eternity. For this and many more reasons, Jesus is a prophet greater than Moses. The Messiah was also to have a priestly duties. Jesus was not a Levite, but only Levites were allowed to be priests. So how could Jesus qualify? Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek predated the Jewish temple, and his very name means King of Righteousness. Melchizedek was so called the King of Sodom, which means King of Peace, Shalom. Melchizedek blessed Abraham, the greater blesses the lesser. 
And Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe. Who gave a tithe? Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Thus, as a priest in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus is greater than Abraham and Levitical priesthoods. He is a heavenly priest who offered a sacrifice that removes sin permanently. Jesus must also be a king in order to be the Messiah. Jesus was from Judah, the kingly tribe. When Jesus was born, wise men from the east came looking for the king of the Jews. When they saw the baby Jesus, they bowed down before Jesus and worshipped Jesus. Jesus told that he would one day sit on a glorious throne. Many people in Israel saw Jesus as their long-awaited king and expected him to set up his rule immediately. Also, Jesus' kingdom is currently not of this world. At the end of Jesus' life, during his trial before the pirate, Jesus did not defend himself. He remained silent. He remained silent except one time when Pilate asked Jesus, I am the king of the Jews. Jesus says, yes, it is, as you say. Another way Jesus fulfilled this Old Testament description of the Messiah is that he was a suffering servant of Isaiah 53. On the cross, Jesus was despised and held in low esteem. He was pierced for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities and oppressed and afflicted. He died with thieves, yet was buried in a rich man's tomb. After his suffering and death, Jesus the Messiah was resurrected. He was raised from the dead and glorified. When he was raised from the dead, he defeated the power of death. Isaiah 53 is one of the clearest prophecies I didn't think find Jesus as the Messiah. It is the very passage that Ethiopian eunuch was reading when Philip met him and explained to him about the suffering Messiah. There are other ways in which Jesus is shown to be the Messiah. Remember last year we studied the book of Leviticus, chapter 22, especially about seven festivals. You know what are the seven festivals? The first one is the Passover, unleavened bread, and the first fruits in the spring, and summertime, the feast of weeks in the in the autumn, there are three, Feast of Trumpets and Day of Atonement and Feast of Tabernacle. Jesus is related to these seven festivals. He fulfilled all of them. Each of the seven feasts of the Lord in the Old Testament is related to and fulfilled by Jesus. When Jesus came the first time, he was our Passover, our Passover lamb or unleavened bread, and our first fruits. The pouring out of Jesus' spirit happened in Pentecost. When Jesus the Messiah returns, we hear the shout of the archangel and trumpet call of God. It is no coincidence that the first four festival day is Yom Tura, the Feast of Trumpets. If Jesus returns, he will judge the earth. This is the fulfillment of the next forest uh, festival, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Then Jesus will set up his millennial kingdom and reign from the throne of David for 1,000 years. They will complete the final four festival, Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, when God dwells with us. And no one, no one else could fulfill these seven festivals except Jesus. To those of us who believe in Jesus as a Savior and Lord, the proof that he is the Messiah seems overwhelming. How is it then, generally speaking, the Jews, Jews do not accept Jesus as their Messiah? How come they do not accept Jesus as the Messiah? Both Isaiah and Jesus prophesied a spiritual blindness upon Israel 
as a judgment for their lack of faith. Also, most of the Jews of Jesus' time were looking for a political savior, not a savior from sin, death, and the Satan. They wanted to Jesus to throw off the yoke of Rome and establish Zion as the capital of the world. They could not see how the meek and humble and lowly Jesus could possibly do that. The story of Joseph provides an interesting parallel to the Jews, uh, Jews missing their Messiah. Joseph was sold into a slavery by his brothers, and after many ups and downs, he was made the prime minister of all Egypt. When a famine hit both Egypt and Israel, Joseph's brothers traveled to Egypt to get food, and they met with Joseph, were they able to recognize Joseph? Were they able to recognize Joseph? No, they could not recognize him. Their own brother standing right in front of them, yet they were oblivious. They did not recognize Joseph for a very simple reason. He did not look as they expected him to look. Joseph was dressed as an Egyptian. He spoke as an Egyptian. He lived as an Egyptian. The thought that he might be their long lost brother, Joseph, never, never crossed their minds. Joseph was a Hebrew shepherd, after all, not Egyptian royalty. In a similar way, most Jewish people did not and do not recognize Jesus as their Messiah. They were looking for an earthly king, not the ruler of the spiritual kingdom. Their blindness was to so great that no amount of miracle made a difference because they were waiting for a political messiah. Still, there are many people in Jesus' day, as well as in our time, who saw the truth about Jesus what is the truth about Jesus? What is the truth about Jesus? What is the truth about Jesus? He is the Messiah. Amen. Can we say that together, please? Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. Please say it aloud together from your heart. Okay. What is the truth about Jesus? He is the Messiah. One more time. He is the Messiah. But the Bethlehem shepherd saw that Jesus was the Messiah. Simeon in the temple saw that Jesus was the Messiah. And I saw that, saw that Jesus was the Messiah and spoke about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Peter and other disciples saw Jesus that was the Messiah. You saw that Jesus was the Messiah. I saw that Jesus is the Messiah. Many of us saw that Jesus is the Messiah. However, there are some people in our church that do not see that Jesus is the Messiah. This is time for us to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Amen. May many more continue to see that Jesus is the Messiah the one who fulfills the law and the prophets. Now, what would you say about Jesus? Jesus is asking you right now, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Can you answer? Can you answer, please? Jesus, you are the Messiah. Amen. I'm going to sing 246, there is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own soul, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, 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 holy world. Thank you, oh, my Father, for giving us your soul, 
Your living, your spirit till the work of earth is done. Amen. Who do you say I am? Jesus, you are the Messiah. Can we make a confession of faith every day? In the morning, when you get up, Jesus, you are the Messiah. In the evening, confess, you are the Messiah. You are the one who saves me from the power of sin. You are the Messiah who rescues me from the power of Satan. You are the one, you are the Messiah who baptizes me with the Holy Spirit. Save me from, our, from the power of sin. Save me from the power of Satan. Save me from the power of death. You are the Messiah. Amen. Peter was called Jesus, the Son of the living God. This meant that Jesus was more than a man. He was a God in the flesh. Jesus was the incarnation of God. Jesus was, had both humanity and deity. Isaac had prophesied that he would be a humble child who was also the mighty God. The Messiah was both in order to be our mediator. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. As a man, Jesus understands human beings in our weaknesses and temptation. As the holy God, he has the power to save us from our sins. Christian faith is to believe in Jesus as both the perfect man and perfect God. He must be both in order to bring about our salvation, to deny either Jesus' humanity or his deity has a serious result. Such belief deviates from true Christianity. It even becomes anti-Christian. We must hold fast that Jesus is the both perfect man and perfect God. Amen. Let's uh, say together, please, the last sentence. Jesus is both perfect man and perfect God. Praise Jesus, the Messiah, the true, the Son of the living God. What enabled Peter to make the first historic confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Let's read verse 17, 12, please. Blessed are you, son of a son, uh, Simon, son of a Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but my Father in heaven. He noticed the word revealed, revealed here. This is the new covenant of worlds. On the world covenant, people studied the law and meditated on it. The blessed man was the one who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. But on the new covenant, the blessed man is the one who gets revelation, revelation from above, like Peter. The Holy Spirit opened up Peter's heart to see something that he could never discover with any amount of human intelligence. There are clever people, smarter people than Peter in his related time who had studied the Bible much more than Peter. But they thought that Jesus was the prince of demons. Huh? They studied the Bible, but they thought that Jesus was the prince of demons. Peter was uneducated, but he received a revelation from God that Jesus is the Messiah. God reveals the scriptures to those who come to him in humility, in humility like little babies. Peter did not gain his understanding through a human efforts or reason. It was revealed to him by the Father in heaven. Indeed, it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation, spirit of revelation, so that you may know him better. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 3 says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In John 16, verse 8, Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he'll convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. In this verse, we see a threefold ministry the Spirit will perform in relation to the unsaved world. 
He will convict the world, that is, he will reprove it, will show it to be wrong. This proof, this reproof will target three areas in which the world needs something, admonishing, sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts us, and the Holy Spirit convicts us that I am a sinner. And the God is holy, we deserve judgment. And then the Holy Spirit will lead us to Christ, to believe in Jesus, and we may be forgiven from our sins, we may have a relationship with God, and enter the kingdom of God. So, then what is the significance of Peter's confession? First, it brings, it brings salvation. It brings salvation. So Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation does not come from our effort, but from a confession of faith in what Jesus has done for us. Many people think that if they have money, they can do everything. Can Money is everything, and with money, I can do everything. Is that true? But we cannot buy salvation with money. Can you buy forgiveness with your money? No. Can you buy sanctification with your money? Can you buy glorification with your money? No way! God's salvation comes only through Jesus Christ to those who repent of their sins and believe in Jesus. This faith is expressed through a confession that Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. Second, Peter's confession of work was commitment to Jesus. Jesus is the Son of the living God. He is the author of life and the source of life. He is the bridegroom and I am his bride. He is the Lord and I am his servant. He is the living God, living God. Jesus is the true vine, and we are like branches. Coming to unto Jesus is like a branch being grafted into a vine. Just as a branch cannot survive without the vine, no one can receive God's life without commitment to Jesus. Most people want to grow and be full of life, but they do not like to make a commitment. They don't want to make a commitment. Last time, do you remember, I saw, I showed you a slide, two feet in a two boats, what will happen? If you put one, boat, one foot in a one boat, another foot in another boat, what will happen to you? You will drown and die. We must make a commitment to Jesus. Commitment, what kind of commitment? 100% commitment. 100% commitment. Without making a commitment to Jesus, we are not connected to God, who is the source of life, and cannot even begin to grow. Commitment to Jesus is the beginning point of our spiritual life and the way to continually grow spiritually. Colossians chapter 2, 6 and 7 say, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus, as Lord, continue to live your life in him, rooted and built up in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with their thankfulness. Third, based on Peter's confession, Jesus builds his church. Amen. Can we say that together, please? Jesus builds his church. When God saves you, it is for you, for your salvation. At the same time, to build his church, to build his church. Let's read verse 18 together, please. 18. Okay. I tell you, I, don't know, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and gates of Hades will not overcome it. Here, this rock refers to Peter in his role of confessing Jesus as the Messiah. As the Messiah. It implies that the other disciples would share in that role as they made a similar confession. Jesus is the foundation of, of the church. Who is the foundation of the church? Jesus. Jesus is the foundation of the church. 
the apostles and the prophets of the earthly church confirmed that Jesus is the Messiah through their testimony and teaching. Through those who testified to the Messiah, Jesus builds his church. So what is a church? What is a church? What is a church? Church is a building. It's not a building. The word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which is defined as an assembly, assembly, or called out ones. The root meaning of a church is not that of a building, but of people. It is a people confess that Jesus is the Messiah and Son of the living God. So can we read the first sentence together, please? It's people who confess that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So even though you come to church in worship service every Sunday, if you did not make a confession of faith yet, you are not a part of the church, even though you come to worship service. So it's essential for anyone, everyone, to make a confession of faith that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of the living God. The church is the body of Christ, for which he is the head, Jesus is the head. Ephesians 1, 22 through 20 says, God placed all things under, the, under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The body of Christ is made up of all believers in Jesus Christ from the day of Pentecost until Jesus returned. The body of Christ is comprised of two aspects, the universal church and the local church. The universal church consists of all those who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And local church is described in Galatians chapter 1 and 2, Paul an apostle and all the brothers with me to churches in Galatia. Here we see that in the province of Galatia, there are many churches, what we call local churches. The universal church is comprised of those who belong to Christ and who have trusted him for salvation. So, the local church, the local church is the where well, the members of the universal church and can fully apply the body principles of First Corinthians chapter twelve. Let's read verse twelve together, please. Encouraging, teaching, and building one other up in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God wants us to do in our church: encourage one another and teach and build one another up in the knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus summed up, summed up the Old Testament law with two sentences. He said the whole law can be summed up in two commandments. Can we read together, please? Love the Lord God with all your heart, with your whole soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In those two verses, those two sentences, the entire duty of a church is summed up. So this is the duty of the church. Love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love one another. If you love other things, idol, then we are not building a church. If we hate one another, then we are not doing what we are supposed to do as, as a member in the body of Christ. So Jesus said that the church he builds has one identifying work, mark. It overpowers, it overpowers the gates of Hades, the forces of spiritual death. On the other hand, if a church is itself overcome by the forces of spiritual death, that is by jealousy, strife, competitive spirit, selfishness, honor-seeking, sexual immorality, idolatry, the love of money, worldliness, bitterness, hatred, unforgiving spirit, pride, arrogance, legalism, hypocrisy, etc., then we can be certain that this is not the church that Jesus is building. Then we can be certain that 
This is not the church Jesus is building. There are kind of very Christians in every church. There are kind of Christians in every church. I hope there's none in our church who are slave, who are slaves to these sins. If any one of us has such sins, we must repent of our sins. Otherwise, we cannot be used by God in building the church. Instead, we'll be used by Satan in destroying the church. So I, I urge everyone in our church to repent of any hint of such a sin and be used by God in building the church. The church, the church of Jesus Christ triumphs over the power of death and the devil. Jesus promised that the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Amen. Can we say that together, please? The gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. Then how can we overcome the gates of Hades and build the church Jesus wants? We must live as Christ-like Christians. We must live as Christ-like Christians. Can we live as Christ-like Christians when we have any hint of jealousy, strife, competitive spirit, selfishness, honor-seeking, sexual morality, idolatry, the love of money, worldliness, bitterness, hatred, unforgiving spirit, pride, arrogance, legalism, hypocrisy, and so on? No. No, no. Only when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and our life becomes conformed to the Jesus likeness, we can live as a Christ like Christians with a Christ like character and Christ like relationships and a Christ like ministry. Conformity to Jesus likeness is God's goal for us as well. So, this is what He predestined. Us for to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. That's what God predestined us to be. So can we sing O oh, to be like it together? O oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. That in our good King, Lord of all creatures, Jesus, thy perfect life is to wear. Go to be like Him, go to be like Him, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy speeches, come in thy fullness, send an own image, give all my power. Oh God, I want to be used by God in building the church. Make me like Jesus in my character, in my relationships, in my ministry. That's what we need to pray every day. Make me like Jesus. Help me to be a Christ-like Christian. May God remove any kind of sin in me, any kind of bitterness, any kind of misunderstanding, any kind of uh, hatred, anger. Please. Take away, take away all those sins. Jesus is Savior, please save me from my sins. Baptize me the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you are my Lord. I don't want to commit any idolatry in my heart. Remove any kind of idolatry. Make me one with Christ so that I may love God, love one another, and form a beautiful body of Christ and build the church, the body of Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul was eager to build this super structure in his own life after he had laid the foundation. His sole desire till the end of life was to know Christ and to be conformed to his death and thus to press toward the goal, the upper call of God in Christ Jesus, to be like Jesus. Paul said that this was the one thing that he pursued after. I want to know Christ and I want to be like Jesus. That's our goal should be. The majority of people, today's believers, however, do not have this kind of passionate desire that Paul had to take up the cross and follow Jesus in order to be like him. They do not realize that the disciples must become like their teacher. Jesus is my teacher. 
He's my brother. He's my savior. He's my baptizer. I want to be like Jesus. But many people, they are not con concerned about being conformed to the likeness of Christ. Instead, they waste their lives in bitterness, anger, jealousy, resentment, unforgiving spirit, hatred, immorality, idolatry, and repeatedly laying the foundation week after week. When will they begin to grow to maturity? When will they grow to maturity? You know, if a baby is born one year, maybe like a, you know, the baker is now about 10 days old, eh? it's okay for him to have a diaper, it's okay. After one year, two years, three years, it's okay to have a diaper. But after you become five, 10, 20, we should not wear diapers anymore. We should grow to maturity. So let us press on to maturity, perfection, and the Christ likeness. Amen. Let's press on to maturity, maturity, perfection, and Christ likeness. Let's love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Let us forgive one another, and love one another, and build up one another. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. Let's read the trailer, please. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. Here Jesus spoke of the church facing battle, spiritual battle, with the forces of spiritual death, the gates of Hades. Many Christians picture the church being attacked by Satan on all four sides, and the church managing to hold on and survive until the Lord returns. But that was not, Jesus said, he did not say that the gates of Hades would attack the church, but the church would attack the gates of Hades and overpower those gates. In those days, a city was surrounded by walls and could be entered only through the gates. If you got through the gates, then you had overpowered it, the city. So Jesus spoke of an attacking church that would be engaged in spiritual warfare and overpower the forces of evil, binding Satan's activities and losing people who are held captive by him. Amen. We have, we are Christians. Jesus is our Messiah. And in the name of Jesus, we can bind Satan's activities. We can lose people who are held captive by Satan. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. The picture we must always keep in mind is that the triumphant church, following a triumphant commander, the Messiah, and attacking the devil, if they are totally committed to God and resist Satan, he will flee from us. James 4, 7, let's read together, please, together. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God. And resist the devil, he will flee from you. He does not just walk away, but he will run away. So we have to walk as Jesus walked on the earth. Whenever Jesus, wherever Jesus went, demons trembled and Satan was scared. Demons were, demons were trembled and Satan was scared. We have to walk on earth in the same way. Joshua 1 3 says, I give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. So we don't live in the fear of Satan or, or what he can do to us. No. He is the one, Satan is the one, who has been afraid of us. We'll never be able to build the church of Jesus Christ if we do not take that attitude against Satan. Satan, gates of Hades will not overcome it. 
I'm a child of God and servant of Christ Jesus. Satan, you have defeated the enemy. Satan, you have no power over me. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. Our Lord Jesus Christ has already bound the strong man. We can now go in and take the strong man's goods. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom of heaven to those who confess him as the Messiah. Let's read verse 19 together, please. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. The idea is not that Peter will admit to people to heaven, but that Peter opened the door over the kingdom to both Jews and Gentiles. When you preach the gospel, those who accept it can enter the kingdom of heaven. When we do not preach the gospel, however, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans chapter 10, 14, 15 reads, How then can they call when the one they have not let believe in? How can they believe in, in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are those feet of those who bring good news. In this sense, we who confess that Jesus is the Messiah hold the power of life and death. We are not ordinary people, but people with a great authority. This authority comes from Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Let's read together, please. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. In Matthew 18, 18, 20, with the second time that Jesus spoke about the church, here he speaks about the authority of the church to bind Satan, and those believers held in his grip. But this authority can be exercised only by a minimum of two believers who are united. And two believers are one in their spirit, the Lord comes into their midst. Only then can they bind Satan's activities. We cannot bind Satan himself. We cannot bind Satan himself. The Lord Jesus will do that himself one day in the future. He will bind Satan when he comes again. But we can bind Satan's activities in the name of Jesus. A husband and wife can keep Satan out of their home forever if they are united. And parents and children, when they pray together, worship God together, read the Bible together, they can cast out, they can keep Satan out of their homes forever. That's why I emphasize, I emphasize the importance of family worship again and again. When you read the Bible and pray together, you can keep Satan out of your home forever. The elders, two elders, can keep Satan out of their church forever if they're united. Satan knows this. That's why he always seeks to separate and husband and separate parents and children so that they may not pray together. And this is the reason Satan always seeks to separate elders in a church. Satan wants to divide us so that we may not be able to pray together. Because when we worship God with the scripture and pray and sing hymns, Satan is afraid of that. So Satan wants to misunderstand each other and develop misunderstanding, break our relationship, so we may not be able to pray together. So we need to have a spiritual discernment. So let's not be fooled by Satan, who wants to divide us and destroy our church. Instead, let's get united in spirit and find Satan's activities those believers held in his grip. If there is any kind of misunderstanding, 
let's get resolved as soon as possible. And we need to get united in Christ with one another. We may bind Satan's activities and lose people who are in captive. Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Jesus was pleased that his disciples were coming to know who, who he was in truth, but still did not want his identity popularly known before the proper time. So let's read one more time together, please. Verse 19, together. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. We have the keys to be reconciled to each other. That Jesus is the key. He's the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, gives the other keys to get reconciled to each other. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will, on earth will be loose in heaven. May God see, restore our broken, broken relationships among us. And we may forgive one another and build up one another and build the church. Amen. In this passage, we have learned that confessing Jesus as the Messiah is the way to eternal life. It brings salvation to one's soul and leads us to a fine and branch relationship with Jesus, through which we can grow spiritually. Through it, Jesus builds his church and opens entrance to the kingdom of heaven. Our church should be engaged in spiritual warfare and overpower the forces of evil, binding Satan's activities and losing people who were held captive by him. Let's make a confession of faith, like Peter, from our hearts. Together, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. May the Lord God help us to press on toward perfection, maturity, and Christ-likeness. May the Lord God help us to be Christ-like in every aspect of our lives and ministries. May the Lord God build a holy, triumphant, and mature church among us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We confess that we are sinners, and Jesus is the only one who can save us from our sins. We confess that Jesus is the only one who can rescue us from the bondage of Satan. He is the only one who can give us forgiveness, eternal life, and the kingdom of God. Help us to make a confession of Christ from our hearts day by day. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And thank God for calling each of us out of darkness so that we may be saved and we may love God and love one another and build a church. What a great honor it is for us to be a children of God and to be used by God in building the church, the body of Christ of God. Heavenly Father, please have mercy on us, O God. We have broken relationships in our church. May God remove any kind of spiritual darkness and we may be reconciled to each other in Christ. We may forgive one another, build up one another, love one another. We may form a beautiful the church, glorious church, holy church. Thank God for this time of prayer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.